Uh, so we're really, really excited to have everybody here today. Uh, this is our new email decade webinar. The Litmus team, we have gotten together, we've done a little brainstorming, and we came up with six predictions on how the email industry will be changing over the next 10 years. Uh, before we get to that, though, I did want to take a quick minute and introduce the panelists today. I'm Jason Rodriguez. I'm the community and product evangelist over at Litmus. Uh, you've probably seen me in a bunch of other webinars over on the Litmus blog. Um, but yeah, I'm joined today by Heather and Whitney. You guys want to introduce yourselves? Hi, I'm Heather Moran, Director of Email Marketing at Litmus. I'm responsible for email marketing strategy and performance. Hey everybody, I'm Whitney, Digital Marketing Specialist here at Litmus. Sort of split my time between content and social media, so I'll be the one interacting with all your tweets today too. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I'm excited to have both of you here. You obviously both spend a lot of time thinking about email, uh, talking to customers, talking to people in the community. And I think collectively, we've spent a lot of time thinking about not only the past 10 years, but what the next 10 years is going to hold for the email industry. So that's what we're going to kind of dig into today. Um, so everybody's excited. It's a new decade, uh, another decade down, another decade to look forward to. Um, we're not immune to that trend of, you know, making predictions, making resolutions, just like everybody else. We like kind of taking a look back at the last 10 years and then trying to figure out what we should be expecting for the next 10 years. Um, so we're really excited for this webinar because that's exactly what we're going to be doing. Uh, I think everybody's been, you know, we, we have all been in this industry for the last couple of years, if not the last decade. We've seen a lot of change over that 10 years, everything from you know, the rise of marketing automation platforms to uh, more advanced interactivity in email campaigns or the introduction of things like Google's uh, promo tabs or annotations. Um, we've all been focusing on trying to be relevant for our subscribers, trying to personalize email, uh, trying to take things to the next level so that we create these better subscriber experiences. Um, but there's there's still a lot to be desired from email marketing for a lot of subscribers. We're still kind of in this place where th there's a lot of improvements all of our email teams could make. Um, there's these growing expectations from subscribers. There's these really advanced platforms and tools that are coming out. Um, and those provide massive opportunities for us as an industry to take email even farther than it ever has been before. So while we've seen a lot of changes over the past 10 years, there's a lot to look forward to as well. And that's what we're really excited to get into today. Uh, but first we wanted to ask everybody in attendance here where you see email going in the next 10 years. Um, so this is where you can make excellent use of that chat window and go to webinar or the litmus live hashtag on Twitter. Uh, throughout this webinar, we invite you to just throw in your comments in GoToWebinar on Twitter. Um, let us know what you're expecting for the next 10 years, whether that's you know new technology, new strategy, different copywriting techniques, uh, how the industry itself it's, is going to change, how your team structure is going to change. Uh, feel free to ask that. We'll try to look at those throughout the webinar. We'd love to see what you're focusing on, what you're planning around for the next 10 years, and see if it aligns with our own predictions and uh, maybe inspire some new predictions after the webinar. So feel free to comment in GoToWebinar or on Twitter using the hashtag LitmusLive, and we'll keep an eye on that and kind of circle back around towards the end of the webinar here. Uh, but first things first, we're going to kick things off with Whitney talking about email's overall role in the marketing landscape. Yeah, I'm excited to kick things off. So first up, how will email's role in marketing change? Our prediction is that email will move from the sidelines to the core of a successful marketing mix. I like to think of it like the winner's circle where out of everything in your marketing stack, email takes that number one spot with the shiny trophy. I feel like all of us saw the email is dead messaging throughout the 2010s and we had a little mix of fear and skepticism. Headlines in the news like, email is dead, here's who zapped it. Email marketing isn't dying, it's already dead. Is Slack killing email, et cetera, et cetera, we're everywhere. Claiming that the purpose and ROI of email just wasn't there anymore. But I think all of us knew that something just didn't seem right about that. All of our research points toward the exact opposite. Email's ROI just keeps growing. With the latest numbers showing that for every $1 marketers spend on email marketing, they receive $42 in return. Email offers the highest returns for marketers year after year. In tandem with that, 
More and more brands are recognizing the power that email brings to the table too. Our latest research shows that 73% of marketers consider email to be important to the company's success. And with that 42 to one ROI, who can blame them? With increased ROI comes increased spending. 46% of brands increased their email marketing spending last year. Litmus certainly did. We grew our email team from a mighty team of one to a dream team of four. But that increase in spending can also go towards email education, training, third-party analytics tools, spam testing tools, and so on. Investing so much in email shows exactly how valuable it is as a channel. I think it can be said without a doubt that email is a marketer's most measurable and reliable channel. You can measure overall campaign performance, but you can also learn a lot about your subscribers' behaviors and preferences. What content resonates the most? How long do people engage with my emails? Your subscribers can answer those kind of questions for you. They want to hear from you. It's why they subscribed in the first place. So you shouldn't squander that insight. Plus, to circle back to spending, you can take you can create, excuse me, a great personalized journey for your subscribers at scale without handing over too much cash. Scaling your email program to reach more subscribers typically doesn't break the bank like it might for other channels in your mix. So back to our prediction. Email will move from the sidelines to the core of a successful marketing mix. How do you prepare? First things first, put email first. Invest more in your email program and learn even more about your subscribers. Nurture that brand subscriber relationship. It's the best channel for providing customers and subscribers with what they want to hear. And second, share your findings. Don't just keep email in a silo. Share those invaluable learnings with the rest of your marketing team. Your customers and your subscribers don't experience your brand in a silo, so why should your marketing team? Email may be moving to the core of your marketing mix, but use that opportunity to spread the knowledge around. If there's a blog post all about design that's doing ridiculously well in your nurture flow, the content team definitely wants to know so it can add more design content to the calendar. If you've got social content or social sharing in your email that's always got high engagement, your social media specialist would love to hear about that too. Maybe it can fuel a social or paid campaign. Yeah, Whitney, I feel like this is, you've been kind of at the center of this on the litmus team, especially uh, where mm -hmm. you've been looking at the things the email team, uh, especially Heather, you and your team have been working on, uh, some of the content, some of the creative, and then taking that into other channels like paid media, uh, social media, all that kind of stuff. And I think that's that's something we're trying to do is take email, make it first, the center of our marketing strategy, and then have our everything we learn about through the email channel kind of filter out to those other channels as well. Um, but there's always struggles. You know, we, we have the struggles like everybody else, just kind of analyzing all of the performance, um, sharing all those findings with other team members and getting everybody on the same track. Uh, but I feel like this is, I totally agree, this is one of those places that everybody could really benefit from and we should hopefully see more over the next 10 years or so. Absolutely. So that brings us to just email marketing strategy in general. So we're talking about email moving from uh, maybe like the sidelines in your marketing strategy uh, to the core part of your email marketing or your marketing strategy overall. Uh, but what is that email strategy going to look like in the next 10 years? And we're going to pass this one over to Heather, who heads up our email team to talk about how strategy is changing in the next decade. Thanks, Jason. So for email strategy, I believe that 2020 marks the beginning of an email renaissance. And the key to this prediction really lies in understanding what I mean by renaissance, which is the rediscovery of classic principles and an exploration of new frontiers. For email, I believe that we'll see a return to the classic principles of permission and relevance and an exploration of new frontiers as it relates to email marketing adapting to the state of modern marketing. And I think this concept of a renaissance is represented really well by Pantone's color choice for the 2020 color of the year, which is classic blue. You can see it there in the bottom left hand corner of the slide. Pantone describes this classic blue as a color that instills calm, confidence and connection and highlights our desire for a dependable and stable foundation on which to build as we cross the threshold into a new era. I think this is really interesting for email marketers to consider since Pantone draws the recommendation from a review of global trends, including technology and art. But let's dig in a little more on the classic email marketing principles of permission and relevance. 
and how they'll evolve in the coming decade. So for 2020 and beyond, I believe we'll see the expansion of data privacy and permission. When the EU's privacy law GDPR went into effect in May of 2018, it raised the bar for companies to obtain affirmative consent in order to market to consumers. But what smart email marketers know is that email is most effective with permission anyway. January 1st of this year, the California Consumer Privacy Act went into effect as well, and it's further evidence of this increased focus on permission. There is similar legislation in the works for other US states right now, because consumers are inundated with messages and increasingly concerned about what data is being collected about them and how it's being used. So the second classic email marketing principle to which we'll see a return is relevance, but not your mom's relevance. This is a concept I call relevance 2.0. Relevance is now simply business as usual for email marketing. And it means sending emails at the right time, the right place, and with the right message. But for the coming decade, relevance 2.0 means sending emails that are personalized, expressive, and emotive. Or more simply, subscribers will demand three things. Know who I am, show me who you are, and make me feel something. With a greater availability of data <clears throat> and increases in the ways in which AI is becoming more available to marketers, consumer expectations of brands will be raised as well because there's greater opportunity to speak to them as individuals. But as we see this technology gain adoption, it'll be more important to stand out. That means having a point of view, articulating it well, and saying something that resonates and connects in order to compel action. But how do we as brands show who we are and make people feel something? That's where creative comes into play. It's the combination of words and visual design with technical execution. Forrester in their predictions 2020 report points to an increasing desire for consumers to feel a connection with the brands from which they buy. They say that companies that do this well will have to pay careful attention to authenticity, both in the values they choose to express and how they express them. Forrester concludes by predicting that spend will flow back into creative as the importance of differentiated branding becomes apparent in a world of digital sameness. So I've talked about how the classic principles of permission and relevance will continue to evolve and continue to exist. But in conclusion, what can be said generally about the future of email strategy? By 2022, the Radicati Group estimates that nearly 4.25 billion email users will maintain an average of 1.86 email accounts. But email will not continue to just work. Smart marketing teams are increasingly considering which channels work best for what message, driven by innovation in AI and a growing focus on customer experience. Email will be used conscientiously and at scale. We'll hear less or hopefully never ever again. Let's send an e-blast, you know you've heard that. And hear more, is this message best conveyed using email? So how can you prepare for these changes? First, get your data in order. It always comes back to this. Understanding what data is known about your audience is really important to uncovering opportunities for how to more effectively target them. The second part is knowing where this data is available and in what systems so you know what you need to focus on to make use of it or where you'll need to do some integration work. And the last part is taking stock of the data available as an output of your email interactions and how those can be applied to create more effective marketing campaigns overall. And the last way to prepare uh, for this upcoming change in strategy is to take a cold hard look at your emails, but not in a vacuum. The key is to do so in the context of the customer journey. Read your interactions as a conversation. Do they make sense and what can be improved? Awesome. I'm, I'm seeing uh, some attendees agreeing with this prediction too, especially uh, I saw Kelly Colton uh, predicting that more states are going to be adopting some version of GDPR, CCPA, uh, and hopefully that's going to get rid of people doing, it's, it's going to make it more difficult for people to just do that blast, that batch and blast mentality approach to email marketing, but hopefully that'll create more relevance and create these cleaner lists and all that good stuff. Um, so that's great to see attendees that are agreeing with our predictions, which is awesome. Um, thanks, Heather. I, I, I want to I go back to one thing that you said around 
making subscribers feel something as we kind of get into this next section here uh, because I feel like that's super important that kind of table stakes is relevance table stakes is data and privacy table stakes is good email creative um, but how do we create that sense of emotion that sense of feeling inside of our subscribers and that kind of leads us to uh, my first prediction for the future of email. Uh, and that's around email design. My prediction is that the 2020s will be the decade of animation and email. Um, and I think this is one of those key ways that people will be able to create that sense of feeling in their subscribers and create those deeper connections with our subscribers so that we can uh, be valuable for them and, and create better campaigns for them. Um, so why do I think this? Why do I think that the next decade will be the decade of animation and email? Um, Forbes has this great study, this great stat that 91% of consumers now prefer interactive and visual content over traditional text-based or static media. Um, and I think this is a trend we've all seen kind of ramping up over the past decade. Uh, we've seen a lot of online publishers really investing heavily, especially in video. Um, we've seen the rise of YouTube, the massive stars, the massive revenue that that has created. We've seen a lot of smaller companies pop up trying to jump on that visual uh, animation and video bandwagon. I think we're gonna see that really ramp up, especially in the email world over the next 10 years. Um, right now we've seen a lot of, through our own research, seen a lot of brands using animation and email, especially with animated GIFs. Uh, animated GIFs have been around for a really long time. Uh, this past year in one of our reports, we saw that a majority of brands are using animated GIFs at least sometimes in their email campaigns. Um, so this is that classic way of doing animation and email because we don't have the ability to really have videos and email reliably across different devices and all that good stuff. Um, so it's already there. The start of this trend is already there, but I think the next 10 years, it's really gonna ramp up and just explode so that we're gonna see that use of animated GIFs and other types of animation uh, across almost all brands and senders in the email world. Um, and there's a couple of reasons why I think that. The first is that animated GIFs are no longer the only solution for creating these animated, really interactive experiences inside of email campaigns. Uh, we've talked a lot on the Litmus blog, we've done them in our own email campaigns, but using CSS animations to create this activity and this motion in, in the inbox. Um, CSS animations are a super way to create these animations because they're typically lighter weight than animated GIFs. Uh, they allow a lot more control over the animation. Uh, you can even create these interactive experiences and toggle these different states using CSS animations. And the great thing is that it's getting wider support across different uh, inbox providers that our subscribers are using. So we're seeing better support for CSS animations and I expect that to grow over the next 10 years or so. Um, getting back to animated GIFs, there's other options uh, on the image format level too, like animated PNGs, which uh, have their own cool benefits as well. This is something we used in a recent Litmus newsletter where we had these animated, uh, when you turn the lights off in our email campaign, these little animated floating ghosts. Um, and this was enabled not through animated GIFs, which we could do, but there were some kind of major uh, design restrictions around that and around uh, transparency in animated GIFs and how it doesn't work that well. Uh, but animated PNGs were a great solution because it allowed us to create these transparent animations using this image file format. Um, and it had pretty good support across uh, different email clients. It's not great, it's not as widely supported as animated GIFs, uh, but it's something that that support is gonna grow as browsers, uh, start supporting supporting animated PNGs, operating systems start supporting it. Um, so we'll see this as a third or a second solution beyond animated GIFs. Uh, the third thing is that AMP for email is on the precipice of just exploding. Uh, we saw AMP for email uh, announced, what, a year, year and a half ago. Uh, there's still a couple of hurdles for it to overcome before it's in like really widespread reuse, uh, mainly support across inbox providers as well as support across email service providers so that you can actually send AMP emails. Uh, but we're getting there and I think we're getting there a lot quicker than any of us really expected. Um, so AMP for email is Google's initiative to create this separate 
markup language that allows you to do some really uh, complicated things inside of email without a lot of overhead on the coding side. It's, it's relatively easy to enable these things via code. Um, so this can add things like carousels and interactive forms inside of your email, uh, all these animations, all this motion and interactivity right in the inbox uh, without too much trouble if you have the right ESP to send it and it's supported across inbox providers. Um, so we're getting there. We now have a number of ESPs that are supporting AMP for email. Uh, so you can actually send those AMP-based email campaigns. And then we're seeing other inbox providers outside of Google that are supporting AMP for email. So it's not just in Gmail where uh, subscribers will be able to take advantage of AMP for email. Um, and I think that's gonna be a huge development over the next uh, couple of years and into the next decade uh, that we're gonna see more people investing in AMP for email. Um, it's not without its problems, it's not without its challenges, but it's one of those things that we'll need to pay attention to because subscribers will be expecting those really rich, really highly animated experiences directly in their inbox. So I expect that to grow kind of massively. Um, so how can you prepare? The first is to learn how to animate emails. Uh, revisit some of those foundational principles around animated GIFs, but then look to expand that, especially using things like CSS animations because they are such a flexible, lightweight and powerful solution for creating these animated experiences uh, in email campaigns. And then the second thing is you should probably start learning AMP now. Um, there's a ton of great resources on Google's developer platform. They have this great AMP playground that allows you to test out these boilerplate examples of AMP code and then adapt them and use them in your own campaigns. But learning AMP is probably gonna be one of the best things you could do uh, over the next year or two as that support really grows if you wanna start creating those richer, more highly animated experiences for your subscribers. Um, so that, I guess that kind of brings us to the email tech stack. Uh, we're gonna see these ESPs um, adopting things like AMP for email, updating their technologies, create these more uh, interactive experiences. We saw the last year, the introduction of interactive content blocks inside of Salesforce Marketing Cloud that was powered by some of that technology that the Rebel folks, people like Mark Robbins uh, were working on um, that got worked into the Salesforce platform. But we're gonna see a lot of different changes for the overall tech stack as well. Um, so my prediction is that the 2020s will see massive consolidation of all of those platforms uh, while requiring more integration between those tools. So it's kind of this double edged sword. Uh, we're gonna see a lot of consolidation of tools, but then at the same time, we'll see the introduction of more third party tools, smaller companies, uh, and the need for marketers to integrate between those different tools. Um, so over the last 10 years, we saw a lot of consolidation. Uh, I think last time we checked was in early 2019 and the mergers and acquisitions in the email industry, all those companies joining forces totaled up around $18 billion um, for mergers and acquisitions. So that's uh, big platforms buying smaller platforms, integrating their tools. Uh, and we're seeing more of this consolidation around these top 10 different ESPs. Uh, so obviously we see things like MailChimp and Salesforce Marketing Cloud kind of leading the way. Marketo's up there, Pardot, Eloqua. Um, marketers are more and more relying on these larger platforms to get their work done and to send their email campaigns, to set up marketing automation, to track and manage all those campaigns and help analyze them. And I think we're gonna see that increasingly over the next 10 years. We'll see some of those smaller companies bought up by the larger companies. We'll see those tools more tightly integrated with each other and this consolidation as marketers are looking to these platforms as opposed to individual tools. Um, the other thing that's kind of driving that is, uh, or my prediction here is that people are working with more people. Uh, in our state of email reporting, in our surveys that we send out, we've seen that a majority of brands involve three or more people in the approval process. And that's just the approval process. When you look at things like the development, the strategy, the copywriting, um, the Q&A and the analysis portions of that email workflow, we see people working with more teams and more people than ever. And that's going to, uh, 
really drive this need for tighter integration between tools and teams and across communication channels. Um, so I, I think everybody really needs to get ready to the kind of get keen to the idea that platforms will be dominating over the next coming next 10 years, the next uh, 12 years, whatever, even as more of those tools are introduced into the workflow, but we're going to require tighter integration between those tools and these big platforms that we're relying on for more and more of our work uh, over the next decade. Um, so integrations are going to become absolutely vital. And this is something we've been focusing a lot on over the last year or so at Lemus is integrating more tightly with all these platforms and with these different tools. Uh, so we have ESP syncing uh, for a number of those top 10 uh, email service providers. We allow people to sync things like Google Drive, Dropbox, and OneDrive, all those files into Litmus and start creating their campaigns that way. Um, and we've announced some cool integrations with uh, more project man management type tools like Asana and Slack and Trello recently. Um, so if you're looking to prepare for this consolidation and this need for integration uh, across these platforms and tools, the first thing you're going to want to do is audit your own tools. Look at what you're using across that entire email workflow. Look at what platform you're using, seeing if it has the capabilities you need for the next decade uh, to sell, set yourself up for success. Um, if you're working with a bunch of different tools, which a lot of people are, we've seen in our research that people are working with a number of third-party tools outside of just their ESP, uh, then you're going to want to figure out how to break out of that silo. You're going to want to make sure that the data from all those different tools makes its way back to your SP or makes it into one consolidated place. Uh, so looking at those integrations, figure out how you can get out of the silo, make sure all of your systems are talking to each other, uh, that all of your data can be shared freely with people. Um, you know, Whitney mentioned that we need to share that data, share our learnings from the email channel with other marketing channels. And looking at those integrations to do that is one of the best ways to break out of that silo. Um, so again, at Litmus, we've been working really, really hard uh, to enable that with the Litmus platform. Um, so if you do want to check out some of those integrations through Litmus, just go to litmus.com slash integrations. Our most recent one was this fantastic integration with Trello that allows you to bring your emails inside of those Trello cards, see uh, you know, the title of the email, the description, the due date, the status, um, see how those many of those tasks on the checklist are knocked off, uh, and really keep track of your email campaigns during that planning process, because so many people are using tools like Trello. Uh, so definitely check that out, but really focus on auditing your tools, see what you need of your platform in the next 10 years, and then making sure you have the tools talking to each other so that you can enable success across your email marketing program. Program. And that's going to bring us to email team structures. Yeah, I think, Jason, my prediction here ties in well to what you were just talking about, which is the opportunity to start leveraging a variety of tools and, and new innovations and in email techniques. So my prediction for email team structures, um, I believe that email specialization will continue to exist and thrive in the coming decade given the complexity of the channel and high ROI, but email marketers need to become increasingly familiar with other channels as the focus for marketing overall shifts towards the single view of the consumer and customer experience. In our 2019 State of Email Workflows report, a third of marketers say that their email marketing is poorly or very poorly integrated with other channels, which I believe points to a few areas of opportunity for growth within email teams. The first being strategy. So in the upcoming 2020 State of Email report from Litmus, Jean Jennings from Email Optimization Shop says that email is being taken more seriously than it has been in the past years. The C-suite is beginning to understand that investing in profitable email programs makes them even more profitable rather than just settling for the returns they are getting from the channel. It follows that for email teams, designing the kinds of email programs that can meet this rising expectation means they must know the areas of opportunity relative to other marketing channels. They have to grow their familiarity with other marketing specialties to be more strategy focused to drive maximum result. But great strategy goes nowhere without the ability to implement it. And that leads to my next area for growth within email teams, combined technical and marketing skill sets. Gartner sees that marketing leaders are increasing investments in technologies that help deliver meaningful customer experiences. What underpins companies' ability to use these tool sets is the talent to be able to use data, integrate tools, and interpret resulting performance, the combination of strategy and technical. 
Forrester predicts that these digital elites, as they call them, will make up a group of in-demand jobs this year. And in this quote on the slide, they say that work personas that require intuition, empathy, and physical and mental agility, including cross-domain knowledge workers, teachers, explainers, and digital elites will add 331,500 net jobs in 2020. It's kind of funny to think about us as digital elites, but um, that's really what they're saying is this unique combination of skills. And this is good for us. This is good for email marketers. We've always been adaptable, curious, self-starters and problem solvers. I believe it signals that our teams need to continue to do this well. And at the same time, I believe that we'll also continue to see tools being created that make what once required a technical skill set available to people who don't have that expertise. <clears throat> so on the next point, um, I talked earlier about how brands are turning to creative for differentiation. With email read times increasing in large part due to the growing attention span for reading email on mobile, email marketers have a bigger canvas. Our 2019 state of email engagement report shows that read times have increased to 13.4 seconds in 2018, which is a 29% increase over the past seven years. This means that we'll see more opportunity for thoughtful and unique expression, especially as email engagement continues to grow. Holding someone's attention and standing out will require a greater injection of brand design and content marketing expertise. So how can you prepare for these changes? You can ready your team and yourself by taking a look at where there is opportunity to make more room for strategic conversations and where additional training or learning might be needed. Make sure you know how your business works and what metrics are important and talk about performance on a regular basis. On the technical front, there are a ton of resources and training programs out there. So start with taking advantage of those. Yeah, I think that's really, I, I feel like my last section and then this section kind of speak to just that vibe of, you know, the decades over or the next decades upon us. Uh, it's a great time for New Year's resolution. So maybe that's one of the key takeaways is that it's a perfect time to audit your te technology stack and then audit your skills and where your skills are across your team to try to plug those gaps and set yourself up for success over the next decade. Um, and I think ESPs are a great resource for leveling up your skills well as well. A lot of them have programs. Um, I think of like Salesforce is like Trailblazers and their uh, Trailhead programs that allow you to gain a lot of those skills uh, and make sure that you are filling all of those gaps that you need, whether it's technical or around marketing or around communication or whatever that happens to be. Um, so I think there's tons of opportunities. Uh, definitely check out, we're going to be announcing relatively soon, uh, dates for Litmus Live 2020, uh, which is a fantastic way to level up those skills as well. So keep your eye out for that. Um, so Whitney, we're going to be talking about uh, the email workflow, which encompasses pretty much everything we've been talking about up to this point. Uh, so how can email marketers expect the email workflow to evolve over the next 10 years or so? Yeah, thanks, Jason. I, I definitely think this prediction sums up all of our previous ones. So bigger teams, robust email strategies and design, demand for more emails and so on. That's a lot of work, you know? So our final prediction for the day is that teams that don't turn to automation and don't streamline their processes risk an overloaded workflow. Our research shows that, well, emails take a long time to make, y'all. <laughs> Big surprise. On average, graphics and design takes 4.1 hours, coding and development takes 3.8 hours, and reviews and approvals take 4.2 hours per email. That's not even considering some of the extra steps we talked about today, like creating AMP emails and fallbacks for email clients that don't support it yet. Plus, like Jason mentioned earlier, people are working with more people with an average of two plus departments and three plus people involved in each email's approval. That can take a lot of time and really stretch your team members thin if you don't have a set process in place. As your email queue grows, popular project management and communication tools like Slack Asana and Trello will grow in importance too. Having these centralized tools will mean less dedicated roles for email project management and more responsibility spread out across individual team members. This will help alleviate some of that stress. So to wrap things up, how do you get ahead of an overloaded workflow? I think the first step would be to take a look at some of the bottlenecks in your team's own workflow. 
maybe you're still hand inlining CSS instead of using a tool like Litmus Builder to speed things up. Maybe you're spending a lot of time during approvals fixing small errors that weren't spotted before, or even pausing campaigns post send because of an error. Take a look at your email workflow as it is now and see if there are any speed bumps along the way that you can smooth out with your new processes or automated tools. In particular, one of those speed bumps might be your approvals. If you're getting comments and approvals thrown at you from multiple channels, consider investing in one centralized tool. Litmus Proof was built to solve that issue of wrangling feedback from so many different places. It's a tool that we, of course, love to use internally, but that our customers find loads of value in too. You can invite your stakeholders into one place to view the desktop and mobile versions of an email, make comments for any changes that need to happen before send, and approve the email too. But even if you aren't using tools like Litmus Proof, it's still a really good idea to centralize all of that feedback and those approvals in a single spot to save time on all of that wrangling. So I think that might wrap up the Litmus team's predictions. I think, you know, we've been getting a lot of predictions from people on Twitter uh, and from our chat window. So many that I've been looking through this entire time. So thank you guys for all of that. Um, a lot of them have been tracking exactly like what we were saying, which is really cool to see. I think there are a few people, and Jason, you'll love this one because we were just talking about it right before the webinar. Uh, multiple people have said extinction. Are we still going to be emailing in 10 years? What do you think? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, that's, I, yeah, I was wondering whether or not we would get somebody predicting that the death of email is imminent, uh, like they have been predicting for the past 10, 20 years. Um, so I don't expect email to go away anytime soon. It's still a massively valuable channel and getting more valuable. Um, we've seen that ROI rise over the last few years. It used to hover around, what, $35, $36 for every dollar spent, and now it's averaging 42 like we saw earlier. In some cases, 44 48 um, So I, I think that's going to continue to grow because, primarily because subscribers are, just people in general, are bombarded by advertising, uh, all this content, all this messaging, across all these different channels whether it's social paid tv direct mail all that stuff and the inbox is still i like to think of it as that kind of like holy personal space online everybody has an email address uh everybody uses it but it's it's this very kind of private space that they expect to talk to their friends uh get business done uh, on top of seeing some of these marketing messages um and i think that's really what's driving this value so i, I don't expect that to change um i do expect email to the industry to uh, kind of change like we've talked about over these six predictions um so i don't think it's going to die anytime soon it's going to keep being valuable and that value will continue to grow, um, which is good for us because we're all in the email industry. So uh, I like to think that our jobs are relatively secure and hopefully we're gonna be seeing more investment, uh, more resources and just better resources so that we can do our jobs better. We can deliver that subscriber value uh, that we're always trying to create. Yeah, I definitely think Ex extinction isn't the word I think evolving is the word you know maybe yes. maybe email as we view it now will be extinct you know maybe we're going to go way more in the direction of AMP where you know things that you do in landing pages sort of come into the inbox but I definitely don't think that email will be dead I do think that we'll keep seeing articles about it though <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah I agree um Whitney and Jason on both of those points I think the thing that makes email so unique and will continue to um, is the permission aspect. I think mm -hmm. people value the ability to control um, the conversation, which may not happen in other channels. And so I see that email is continued to be valued for that. Um, I do, like you kind of pointed to Whitney, see the opportunity for it becoming much more interactive. Um, you know, I think with advertising in general, it was like this flat thing that you looked at and you know we're beginning to see the use of kind of interactivity um, coming into email more and more it's interesting to consider how that will change and grow you know how can email be much more proactive um, in promoting engagement and so i think we'll start to see uh, email grow in that direction and uh, it's kind of exciting to think about yeah 
Yeah, I saw a couple of questions come through around the use of video and email, if we're going to see video becoming prevalent in email. Um, and I, I would say I don't expect that to happen because email support across different email clients and devices for actual video and email has traditionally been terrible. Um, I don't expect that to change anytime soon. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I do think we're going to see this higher level interactivity driven by animations and driven by things like AMP and email. Um, so you can create those interactive experiences. You can fake the idea of video and email. Uh, Alice Lee, who's one of our email developers, has this great post about this faux video technique. So she's using CSS animations to create the illusion of video and email. I think stuff like that will continue to grow uh, in use. but actual video and email probably won't see that widespread usage because there's so many legacy email clients, they're not gonna update anytime soon to support just video and email. Um, so it's not necessarily worth it to invest that time in trying to get them to because it's unlikely to happen. Um, and I'd also say, you know, it's what what is the need for video and email um, when we can create these more interactive experiences using CSS animations, using AMP for email. Um, if you wanna include an video and email, why do you want it there? You might want them to pop open a landing page where you can better like see what they're doing and better tailor that experience uh, or that video experience on your landing page as opposed to the inbox. So I don't expect to see video um, get widespread usage in email, but these other animation techniques and this interactivity, I think is really gonna drive a lot of work over the next 10 years. Yeah, and Jason, since you were just talking about AMP, uh, we have a couple of questions from a few of the attendees about AMP. Specifically, how does AMP detect or fall back based on the email client's rendering capabilities? Sure. So AMP is interesting in that it's uh, it's a different file that you're sending with your email campaign. Uh, so if you think about HTML emails, we're sending two files anytime we send a campaign. We're sending the HTML file, uh, which is what most people think of when they think email marketing, and then we're sending a plain text version of that email, or hopefully you are, you should be. Um, so for anybody that doesn't have HTML enabled in their inbox, they'll see that plain text version of an email. Uh, so AMP will add a third version of an email. So it's this kind of proprietary separate coding language uh, that looks a lot like HTML. It's very similar to HTML. So if you're familiar with HTML, uh, you should be able to code AMP-based emails without too much trouble. And there's tons of resources. I think the website's amp.dev uh, that Google set up for the overall AMP project. Um, so inboxes that support AMP will see that AMP file, that version of the email, and render that version of the email. Uh, if they don't support AMP, then they essentially just ignore that version of the email, and they'll just fall back to the HTML version that you're already sending. So it's not a ton of uh, it's not a lot to worry about, really. If, if it's not supported, then just make sure your regular HTML version of the email uh, looks good, renders well across email clients, and that's what's going to be seen by a lot of subscribers until AMP support is really widespread. Um, so there's more work to get that AMP version working. It's that third version of your email you kind of have to worry about. Um, but a lot of times you can really take that original HTML version of your email campaign, uh, build that out first, make sure that's working well, and then the AMP stuff is an enhancement on top of that. Um, so you'll work from that version, then build your AMP version. If that AMP version is not, not working or not supported, then it will fall back to the really good looking HTML version. Perfect. And I think sort of the exact opposite question of AMP for email, is there still a place for purely text only emails? Heather, you want to take this one? Yeah. Um, you know, I think there is a place for largely uh, text emails for those kind of short interactions, um, more of like transactional notification types. Um, you know, I think I still see this used widely in just sales, uh, sales email messaging where it's conversational. Um, and, you know, when you're having a conversation with somebody, the intent is to convey your meaning, which can be done through just words. So a lot of times that can be uh, effective. I don't see that going away. I think people have a desire to know that they're really talking to somebody. And sometimes it seems like when it gets more highly designed, uh, you lose that, 
that feeling or that sense of interacting with someone. So I think there's still a place for that. Yeah, I totally agree with you. It's yeah, I think those are the kind of emails when you're trying to create like a truly personal connection between two individuals. Uh, then it makes sense to use those. So if you have a specific person that email's coming from, um, or for a lot of those transactional emails, that plain text-like version of an email is really, really important. Uh, I did just see another Jason, great name by the way, uh, comment in GoToWebinar that text emails for smart homes too are really important. I think that's absolutely true. Uh, we've seen over the last 10 years, uh, this rise of voice-enabled interfaces. Uh, so things like Siri and Google Home, I hope my Google Home doesn't come off, go off right now. Uh, Alexa, all those uh, tools that people are using more and more. Uh, and for a lot of them, um, text-based emails are how they're gonna be able to read your content. Um, so Alexa is the main one that provides really good support right now for reading emails and inboxes. Um, so right now they'll they'll kind of like parse through your HTML, but if you're sending a text-based email or plain text or something like that, it has a really, a, a much better experience because it does feel conversational, it does feel personal, and it's easy to read out, it makes sense like that. Um, but I totally expect you know, voice interfaces to expand over the next 20 years as well, because uh, they've exploded over the last year or two. Um, so text emails are gonna be super important for those use cases as well. Um, so great comment, Jason, I like it. <laughs> Jason, yeah, you beat me to it. I was definitely gonna bring that up <laughs> if you hadn't seen it. Um, yeah, I mean, text emails are just naturally screen reader friendly. Yeah, um, totally. So definitely, definitely still a place in the world for purely text only emails. Um, cool, so I've actually got a couple of questions around accessibility too. So while we're sort of on that track, um, back to Jason, back to sort of your conversation around 2020 being the year of animation and the year of uh, GIFs, GIFs, not GIFs, I said it. Um, how can you use animation and, and GIFs and still be ADA compliant? So how do you see it, animations being affected by accessibility? Yeah, so uh, when you're using like the file format, so animated GIFs or animated PNGs, um, you're still going, going to want to include what you would for normal images. So using that alternative text, the alt tag on those image uh, tags is absolutely important um, because that's what gives people using assistive technology like screen readers uh, that content actually have read out loud to them so they know what's contained in that content. Um, so I think that that kind of like best practice always use alternative text on your image tags uh, that still applies for animations. Uh, it's just really figuring out a good way to describe that animation. Um, I think the key though is making sure that if there's something vital, some vital message, the most important thing, uh, try to make sure that it is understandable outside of that animation, outside of that imagery, um, whether that's in like a headline, some body copy, the CTA, whatever that happens to be, so that there's still that context uh, for people that aren't sighted and can't see that animation. For things like CSS animation uh, or AMP for email, the great thing about those is that it still relies on HTML and CSS to figure out those animations and like make those things move or make that interactivity work. Uh, so that still gives those screen readers that assistive technology, those hooks to draw from. Um, so that's, there's still HTML, there's still text, there's still all that content that is screen reader friendly. It just happens to be inside of this interactivity or inside of this animation. So screen readers largely can still take advantage of that HTML content. It's just the visual display of it is different. Um, so I think if you're just sticking to those really basic foundational uh, best practices for coding, you're gonna be fine if you lean more on animation interactivity. Um, just make sure you have that alternative text, make sure you're animating HTML elements with actual text um, or images with alt text on them so that people can get what they need from your email. Awesome. Uh, next question, Heather, I think this will be a good one for you because it's sort of what you were touching on when we were sort of discussing the extinction of email. Um, it's sort of half prediction, half question. Companies paying to appear in people's inboxes and subscribers monetizing their data. How do you feel about things maybe going in that direction? Um, that's an interesting one. I, I mean, I think we've seen a little bit of that, a foray into that. 
And I don't know that I quite see that approach um, as popular currently as maybe it, it had been. Um, so it's an interesting question. What, I, what I've kind of thought about is, you know, with Gmail, you often see it served up that you haven't read this in a while. Do you want to unsubscribe? So what I really wonder about is opportunity for brands to kind of flip that conversation and um, you know if it is relevant maybe a suggestion is provided there rather than an opt-out so uh, rather than it just served up as advertising i wonder where there might be opportunity for proactively those recommendations to be made um, by email providers and and kind of pull in brands in that regard Awesome. Jason, anything to add or Heather pretty much covered it? No, I think she's good. Yeah. Perfect. Um, I did see, uh, I'm going through all these questions and stuff too. I like <laughs> There's a lot of around. them. There are a ton of them, which I love. Um, do you see any drastic redistribution of the market share between email clients in the near future? Um, and I think that's an interesting one because people, I feel like people worry about that because there's so many different mm -hmm. email clients out there that you have to test on. Um, so are we going to see like a shuffling around of that? And my prediction, which you two might disagree with me, I don't know, but um, <laughs> I, I would say no, I don't expect like a massive redistribution of market share. Um, so right now we we actually track this on emailclientmarketshare.com. Uh, so let me looks at all the opens across our email analytics platform um, for those devices and those different email clients. And we have this kind of top 10 leaderboard. Um, so right now, number one is Apple iPhone, which is just iOS mail, their default mail client, uh, followed up by Gmail and then Apple mail on desktop and Outlook uh, kind of goes down from there. So just like the email marketing tech stack is, uh, in this period of consolidation, a lot of marketers are just gravitating towards these top 10 ESPs. Um, I think the exact same thing is happening with consumers and email uh, and inbox providers. So I, I think people are going to stick to Gmail, stick to Apple Mail, stick to Outlook because that's what they know. Um, those there, There's always smaller third-party email clients that pop up, um, but that's one of the biggest... Uh, areas of acquisitions um we see you know outlook will scoop up some smaller email app that's available on android and ios and they'll just work those features into outlook.com or the outlook app um the same thing goes for like yahoo and gmail and all those those providers so i think that exact trend will just continue um and at some point people will kind of just default to those major uh, inbox providers like they already do. Um, we might see fewer and fewer of those third-party tools being developed um, or being developed with the intention of being acquired, which is kind of what they seem to be doing right now. Um, so I don't, I don't think there's going to be a big worry there. We're still going to have to worry about all those legacy email clients, like the different versions of Outlook, um, but we're not going to see like an introduction of some crazy new inbox provider that screws up all your rendering. Um, so I, I don't think there's too much to worry about there. I actually agree with you. I don't know about Heather, so. Cool. I actually don't have anything to say. <laughs> yep, I agree, it's not at all. <laughs> Microsoft, Google, and Apple will continue con to control the world. Uh, I guess what it breaks down to. Mm-hmm. Cool, I think there's one really neat question, um, or actually one really neat prediction uh, that we had on Twitter from Tyson, um, who bets email clients will adopt a visible verified badge of sorts um, to show a visual sender is I think it's really interesting, especially with the direction that the industry is going and with Bimmy support, um, very similar to verified accounts on social media like Twitter is what Tyson says, what do you think? Yeah, I, I totally think so. I think that's a fantastic prediction um, and one we should all kind of prep for because we have seen that with Bimmy, um, which is, I can't even remember, what is it, like brand identifier marketing indicator or something, whatever it stands yeah. for. <laughs> yeah. 
it's it's like a system for getting yourself verified and uh, you know it doesn't have widespread adoption right now with inbox providers but i could totally see that happening um we know like outlook.com and outlook in general is experimenting with similar things um gmail does not necessarily like verified but it'll pull in people's like avatars or company logos and i think that's how it's going to happen is you'll have to have some sort of data verified with your email campaign or with your sender your sending domain um that pulls in that kind of content so that people can see that it is who you are um so i, I totally agree i think that that prediction is spot on that we're going to see more of that kind of verification type stuff um but i i think the bad part is that it's going to be kind of like left up to each inbox provider to figure out how they do that um, I'm hoping something like Bimmy takes hold and there's just this kind of standardized way to do it. Um, but I, I don't expect that to necessarily happen anytime soon. Um, so we're going to be left trying to figure out how to deal with each inbox provider, which could be a little bit frustrating, but in the long run will hopefully be good for consumers because they know who they're interacting with. Yeah, just to add to that, I think that there's a greater desire and a greater need with um, how sophisticated artificial intelligence is enabling um, different different things to become that there's a greater desire to need to know what's real and what's not real. And I think it's becoming increasingly hard to do that. So I think that's a great prediction, um, one that I could definitely see coming true. All right, Jason, unless you have one in mind as you're scrolling through these uh, questions and predictions, I think one thing that I feel like I would be remiss to not mention, especially as we see its emergence in 2019, is dark mode. So mm, any yeah. general thoughts or comments on the emergence of dark mode and the impact it has on design and testing? Yeah, I think that's that's a great one to end on because um, we've seen in our own research, we have uh, Lily Worth, who's a member of the email team, has been doing a lot of research, a lot of writing on uh, different design trends in the industry of the last you know year or so but then looking forward and i think she rightly identified dark mode as one of those trends moving forward that we're going to have to pay closer attention to um and i totally agree i think dark mode is something we should not necessarily you know would give all of your time to but it's it's an important design consideration um so uh, Almost all major operating systems, I think all major operating systems at this point, provide some sort of dark mode version of their operating system. Um, but not all inbox providers will switch your email to a dark mode version, uh, whereas some inbox providers will do it without you <laughs> having really any say over like how your email renders in that version. Um, so I, I think we're going to see more of a focus on that, more inbox providers offering those dark mode versions. Um, but hopefully, like we're seeing, a lot of the underlying technology in email takes its cues from the web side. Um, so in the web world, we have CSS rules that we can apply that will allow us to style emails or web pages, whatever, for a dark mode version. Um, so I think we're going to see that filter into most inbox providers as well, so that we'll have the tools to uh, have really fine-grained control over how our email renders in dark mode. Um, but it's one of those things that I, on the surface level seems like such a um, kind of like vanity type feature for people, like, oh, I just want dark mode because it looks cool and it's new. Uh, but it actually has some really significant impacts on uh, things like battery life on your devices, um, things uh, like uh, people that have different visual uh, disabilities and they need that dark mode version for better readability, better understandability. Um, so I, I think it is one of those features that is deeper than it looks at first sight and hopefully we'll get the tools over the next couple of years to take advantage of it and provide better experiences for people. Cool. I think we're about a minute over. I'm seeing people drop off, hopefully to grab some lunch, which is what I'll be doing in a minute here. Um, so we did want to just thank everybody for joining us in our new decade of email uh, webinar. We had a lot of fun going through some of these predictions and looking at all the predictions that everybody was uh, sending our way. There are a ton to get through. 
Um, so we'll definitely look at some of those and try to work them into the blog post, which will be available on limits.com slash blog uh, in a couple of days, give us a little bit of a turnaround time. Um, and definitely keep an eye out there or go to litmus.com slash subscribe to subscribe for our newsletter. Uh, Heather mentioned Gene Jennings in our state of email report. We are working on our state of email 2020 report, uh, which will be a fantastic resource for uh, email marketers of every stripe to go through and kind of prep for the coming year. Um, so definitely check that out and uh, we'll be hopefully announcing it soon. We're, we're still working on it. Um, but that'll be a fantastic resource to so check that out. So Whitney, Heather, thank you so much for joining me in today's webinar. I had a lot of fun. Hopefully you did too. Us too. Of course. Thanks, Jason. Every awesome. time. And we will see everybody in the next webinar. So just keep an eye out uh, in your inbox. Go to limits.com slash subscribe uh, to find out when that's happening or visit us at limits.com slash blog. Until next time, cheers. Thanks, everyone.